Heavenly Father, we ask you to meet with us now in the power of your Spirit. Speak to us by your Spirit through your Word. And let your Word not merely increase our knowledge for the sake of increasing our knowledge, but increase our knowledge with the view of making us more like your Son, more able to serve Him and help others in His wonderful name, the name of the one who saved us and whose name we pray, Jesus, our Savior, our righteousness and our only true hope. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, please. The resurrection chapter. Paul writes this in verse 40. There are also heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is one and the glory of the earthly is another. There is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon and another glory of the stars. Star differs from star in glory. Paul speaks of the resurrection in terms of stars. And he's drawing on various Old Testament passages when he speaks of the resurrection. My favorite passage in the Old Testament is in the book of Job, chapter 19, speaking about the resurrection. I know that my Redeemer liveth, and he will take his stand upon the earth on the last day. Even though my flesh is decayed, yet with my own eyes shall I see God. The Old Testament, the Tanakh, speaks of the resurrection as much almost as the New Testament, if you read it correctly. He's drawing on various Old Testament texts. And he also speaks of Jesus being the second Adam. The second Adam. All four Gospels tell us that Jesus rose at around dawn. In biblical typology, the rising of the S-U-N is generally a metaphor for the rising of the S-O-N. Even in the Old Testament, as Isaiah said, Arise and shine, for your light has come. The glory of the risen Lord is brighter than the sun. The astral phenomena, the sun, the moon, the stars. In the book of Revelation, you have to understand these things have a double meaning. There's a literal meaning, but a spiritual meaning. When astral phenomena begins to happen in the last days, they will be manifestations of things that are happening spiritually. God told Abraham his descendants will be like the stars of heaven. In the Bible, stars are generally symbols of either angelic beings or Abraham's descendants, meaning Jews who have believed, together with the spiritual descendants of Abraham, Gentile Christians who are grafted in and who become children of Abraham by faith, through faith in the seed of Abraham. Abraham was a Gentile who God converted to Judaism. That's why he's the father of all who believe, both Jew and Gentile, because he was both. And hence, his descendants who believe, both Jew and Gentile, as Abraham was both a Jew and a Gentile, are the stars that will shine forever. When the sun and moon don't give their light, again, the rising of the sun is Jesus. The sun will not give its light. A spiritual darkness will overcome the earth in the last days, what we call sometimes the Great Tribulation, and the sun won't give its light. The sun has no light of its own, it only reflects the light of Jesus. Hence, the church will no longer reflect his light. There's always an ambiguous meaning in these eschatological texts to do with astral bodies. But we're concerned about these stars. One third of the stars will be swept from heaven in the great apostasia. A third of the stars will fall with the manifestation of Antichrist. Just as some scholars think, a third of the angels followed Satan. But let's look what Paul is talking about. Star differs from star in its glory. He draws on Old Testament images about the resurrection. Specifically, he draws on one in Hosea, and he draws on one in the book of Daniel. Let's look, first of all, to the book of Hosea, chapter 6. Hosea, chapter 6. Hosea in Hebrew is Hoshea. That S-H sound is a root known as a Shoresh in Hebrew, which means salvation. For instance, Hosea is Hoshea, but Isaiah is Ishayahu. Joshua is Yehoshua. Jesus is Yeshua. Josiah is Yoshia. They all have the root meaning of salvation. And in the book of Hosea, chapter 6, we read this in verse 2. He will revive us after two days and raise us up on the third day that we may live before him that we may live before him, he'll raise us up on the third day. Jesus raised us on the third day, we raise on the third day. Why does it say we raise on the third day? 
Some theologians speculate that because a day with the Lord is like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day, as Peter quotes, that it may mean that Jesus is coming sometime between the second and third millennium. Well, that gives you a thousand years to play with. Maybe they're right. But we know this. The reason it says we will raise on the third day is because he did. The resurrection of Jesus is a proliptic event. In other words, his resurrection and ours are the same event. He was simply the chronological first of it. That's what Paul tells us again in 1 Corinthians 15. Jesus is the first fruit of the resurrection. Fulfilling the Hebrew feast of first fruit. Precisely at sunrise, on the first day of the week, Sunday morning of Passover week, the high priest would go into the Kidron Valley. Now this is not Easter. All four Gospels tell us that Jesus did not die on Good Friday, nor did he raise from the dead on Easter Sunday. That came about as a result of the Quadridecimian schism. These days were actually pagan festivals. It didn't happen then. All four Gospels tell us it happened at Passover, Pesach. But on the Sunday of Passover week, the Hagmatzot, the high priest would go into the garden, precisely at sunrise, into a garden overlooking uh, um, between the Temple Mount and the Mount of Olives, Har Zayatim. And if you come with us to Israel, we'll show you where it was. And he would wait for the first bit of sunlight coming up on back of Har Zayatim, the Mount of Olives. And the minute he saw it, he would ceremonially harvest the first stalk of grain coming out of the earth for the spring harvest. At the very hour of the very day when the high priest was bringing this first stalk, called the first fruit, into the temple, Jesus was the first fruit of the resurrection, raising from the dead the same precise day. In fact, the same hour, all four Gospels associate his resurrection with sunrise. He's the first fruit. Because his death is our death, his resurrection is our resurrection. Now, one question I get a lot at Passover time, at Easter time, is this. And it causes some people a considerable amount of upset. Did Jesus die on a Thursday or a Friday or a Wednesday? <coughs> Where do you get the three days and three nights? We've got to understand something. In the Hebrew way of counting time for any religious or ritual purpose, the counting or the reckoning of time is based on the creation narrative in Genesis, or Lehoshek, light to dark. <coughs> Meaning, it was evening, it was morning, it was the first day. Okay. It doesn't matter if there's one hour or ten hours left in a day. Once the sun goes down, it's reckoned as a day. Okay. If he was crucified on a Friday and the sun went down, that would be one day, one night. Saturday would be the second day because the sun goes down on Saturday. He raises on the third day, no problem. The question is, where do you get the three days and three nights? Two explanations when you understand the Jewish background. One is, several times a year you have a double Sabbath, which among other things, helped compensate for the differences between the solar and the lunar calendar. Okay. However, turn with me to the book of Amos, chapter 8, please. Amos gives a prophecy about the last days that will in some way happen that, that was in some way already fulfilled in the first coming of Jesus, even though it has a future eschatological meaning for his return. And he says this in verse 9 of chapter 8, It'll come about in that day, declares the Lord, that I will make the sun go down at noon and make the earth dark in broad daylight. Three times in the Bible, God interferes with time. Three times he changes the way time is counted based on the sun and moon. Three times. The first time is in the book of Joshua, where Joshua stops the sun for a day. The second time is where Jesus dies on the cross. You had a double sunset. And the third time is in the book of Revelation, chapter 8, where the length of the time for the sun and the moon, the night and day, is cut to 16 hours. It happens three times. God interferes with time. Okay. I shall make the sun go down at noon. Now when Jesus died on the cross, it became dark. Some people have suggested this could be an eclipse. Absolutely impossible. Because it was Passover, it had to be the opposite time of the lunar month. It had to be the diametric opposite phase of, of, of the moon. So it couldn't, that, that an eclipse would happen. So it couldn't possibly be an eclipse. You actually had God interfering with time again. It became dark. 
Hence, no problem, three days and three nights. For ritual purposes, Jews would always tabulate time based on light to dark because of the creation. Okay? Doesn't matter how many hours. Doesn't matter how many hours. Technically speaking, a day in Iceland, this could be six months, technically speaking. In fact, Orthodox Jews have halakha, rabbinic law, to decide <laughs> how they're going to observe the Sabbath because of there's no sunsets or so on. With that in view, let's go back to Hosea. That's simply doing justice to the context. He's talking about the resurrection. And he begins describing the following situation. In verse 3, So let us press on to know the Lord, for his going forth is as certain as the dawn. Again, a typological allusion to the resurrection. He raises at dawn according to all four Gospels. And he will come to us like the rain, like the spring rain watering the earth. What shall I do with you, O Ephraim? What shall I do with you, O Judah? For your loyalty is like a morning cloud and like the dew which goes away early. Understand what it's saying here. First of all, it is saying Ephraim, the northern kingdoms, the ten tribes of the north, and Judah. Judah reckoned itself faithful. It said, those ten tribes up north, Ephraim, in Israel, on the north, they're the unfaithful Jews, we're the right ones. We have the temple, we have the right lineage of David, we have the right high priest, we're the true Jews. Those guys up north are always getting into idolatry. Something happens when Judah becomes as bad as Ephraim. And that has happened in the church today. So-called evangelical churches have become very often as bad as Roman churches, as liberal churches. In God's sight, Brian Houston is no better than Bishop John Spong. Both of them have a different gospel. Judah becomes as bad as Ephraim. The kind of corruption you see in the Roman church when they were selling indulgences to build the cathedrals. Today there's Pentecostal pastors selling Holy Ghost miracle handkerchiefs for 20 four pounds British, 75 Australian dollars to take away debt. It's just as corrupt. What's the difference? It's fetishism. Exploitation of the poor. Ephraim becomes as bad as Judah. And it makes a contrast here between the faithfulness of God and the unfaithfulness of man using clouds. Now we're told there's clouds of witnesses in the New Testament, clouds of figures of witnesses in the Bible. But the water in the clouds forms something called Maim Hayim in Hebrew, living water. Isaiah chapter 44, verse 3. I will send out the rain, I will pour out my offspring, uh, my spirit on your offspring. The rainy seasons, the former and latter rain, are figures of outpourings of the Holy Ghost. Thus, in Jude's epistle, we see there's waterless clouds. There's believers who have no witness. The power of the Holy Spirit is not in their witness because of their lives. The epistle of Jude deals with the subject of backsliders in the church. Oh, they're clouds all right, they're witnesses, but there's no water in it. This water is the Holy Spirit being outpoured, Isaiah 44, 3 tells us, and Jesus picks this up in John chapter 7. The water comes down and goes into the water table and forms living water, Maim Hayim. This he spoke of the Holy Spirit. Isaiah says it's the Holy Spirit, Jesus says it is, but you've got waterless clouds. The unfaithfulness of God's people is this, that the clouds show up, but there's no water in them. The same as Jude says, they're waterless clouds, they're backsliders. The Spirit's not in there. As we've been pointing out these last few days, the fruit of the Spirit is, among other things, self-control, not the lack of it. When you see a lack of self-control, that's not God's Spirit. The Holy Spirit always points people to Jesus, never himself. Our faith is pneumocentric, not Christocentric. John 14 through John 17, Jesus says the Holy Spirit will point people to Him. We worship the Holy Spirit in the context of the Trinity, as we did today when we sang Holy, 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 God in three persons. That is perfectly biblical. Perfectly biblical. No problem. No question. No problem. But when you pray to the Holy Spirit, not one time, not one verse in the Bible does that. When you see this stuff, Good morning, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, let your fire fall. Holy Spirit, we worship you. Benny Hinn's book, Good Morning, Holy Spirit, that tells you it's not the Holy Spirit. 
A lack of self-control, the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. Toronto and those deceivers who promoted it, it's not, they're not of God's Spirit. They're waterless clouds. Okay. The Holy Spirit points people to Jesus, never himself, and his fruit is always self-control. If someone is not in control of themselves, God's Spirit is not in control of them. And some of the things that have gone on, as you know, are outrageous, but we know that. Let's move on. When God shows up, the rain comes. But when man shows up, the rain doesn't. It's comparing the faithfulness of God with the unfaithfulness of man. This goes all the way back again to Father Abraham. In Genesis 15, when Abraham makes the covenant, it was an ancient Near Eastern suzerainty ritual. And the way you'd make a covenant in a suzerainty ritual, which Abraham did, was you'd sacrifice an animal and bisect its carcass. And both, you say in Hebrew, lachtoch brit, to cut a covenant. That's how they made the covenant like signing a contract. They bisect the carcass of the animal that was sacrificed, and both parties, the suzerain and the person making the contract with the suzerain or the covenant, would walk in between the two halves of the animal. Now, you notice that only the flame in Genesis 15 went through, Abraham didn't. That flame in Hebrew is called shalchevet yah, the flame of Yahweh, just like the pillar of fire. Only God went through, not Abraham. God knew from the beginning that he would be faithful. Abraham's descendants wouldn't. Fortunately, that the validity of a covenant never depends on the unfaithfulness of man, but only on the faithfulness of God. Otherwise, God would be finished with the Jews, which he isn't, and he'd be finished with the church, which he isn't. It doesn't depend on our unfaithfulness, but only his faithfulness. And that's what Hosea is telling me. And he says this in verse 5, Therefore, because of the infidelity, I hoon them in pieces by the prophets, and slain them by the words of my mouth. And the judgments on you are like the light that goes forth. For I delight in loyalty rather than sacrifice, and in knowledge of God rather than in burnt offerings. Liberal higher critics will try to say, well, this proves that, that the Levitical sacrifices were never intended by God, or that there was some kind of a split between the prophets and the priests. The priests believed in sacrifices, the prophets didn't. This is absolute nonsense. What it means is, the rituals are no good without the right heart. They always had the right rituals, all right, but their heart was wrong. I delight in loyalty rather than sacrifice, and in knowledge of God rather than in burnt offerings. If there's not knowledge of the Word of God, there's not a knowledge of God. One Assemblies of God deceiver in England once said, our fellowship is not based on the Scriptures, it's based on Jesus. The Word became flesh. Jesus is the Scriptures. The Bible doesn't make that distinction. He did, because he's an Assemblies of God liar. No wonder decent men like David Wilkerson and Philip Powell have pulled out of the Assemblies of God, because it's in the hands of liars and heretics. Where do they get this distinction? You see, they had the rituals. They had big celebrations. They had big events. But God wasn't in it. They had hill songs, but God wasn't in it. Like Adam, and again, this is what Paul draws on in 1 Corinthians 15, like Adam, they've transgressed the covenant. They have dealt treacherously against me. And Jesus is the second Adam. There's two generic men in God's covenant. You're either in the first Adam or the second. When you're born, you're of the first Adam. When you're born again, you're of the second Adam. But they go back behaving like the first Adam. They go back to the flesh. Just like Jude says, they're twice dead. They were, born, they were dead, born again, and they're dead again. Uprooted trees, not trees of righteousness. Gilead is a city of wrongdoers, trafficked with bloody footprints. And as raiders wait for a man, so a band of priests murder on the way to Shechem. Surely they've committed crime. Notice the treachery was the clergy. They were a pack of crooks. They're Pastors were crooks. They were con men. They were people with big events, promising things they couldn't deliver. And it was about money. God says it's a crime. A priest waits. And a priest murder. Make no mistake, false doctrines kill. I know people who are in their grave. Not because it was God's time for them to go home, but because they believed in hyper-faith teaching about healing. And now they're dead. Now they're dead. These doctrines kill. 
Not only do they want to take your money when you're alive, money preachers even have will packs. So you'll give your money to them after they put you in the early grave. God says, a band of priests murdered them on the way. Surely they've committed a crime. In the house of Israel, I've seen a horrible thing. Ephraim's harlotry is there. Israel has defiled itself. That's the north. But also Judah, there's a harvest appointed for you. Yet despite this, it ends by saying, when I restore the fortunes of my people, God is always so gracious. He'll always take the remnant and restore them. Now let's understand what this means. Hosea's day was like ours, but a resurrection is coming. Paul draws on this. And then from drawing on this Adam imagery, he talks about the stars. Where does he get these stars in terms of the resurrection? He gets it from the book of Daniel, chapter 12, please. Let's move on now. We've had the preliminaries. Let's look at Daniel chapter 12, commencing in the first verse. Now at that time, Michael, the great prince, who stands guard over the sons of your people, will arise. And there will be a time of distress such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time. And at that time, your people, everyone who was found written in the book of life, will be rescued. Daniel has a specific prophecy for Israel and the Jews, but a general prophecy that also applies to the church. We have to remember it's also something specific for Israel. And he talks about a time of great distress. For the Jews, it's known as Hatekofat Hatzarat Yaakov, in the words of Jeremiah the prophet, the time of Jacob's trouble, the great tribulation. That's what Israel is being regathered for now, the great tribulation. Contemporary events in the Middle East are setting the stage. The Jews will be deceived by the Antichrist. Be very careful of these false organizations who call themselves Christians and they aren't. Look out for Ebenezer. Look out for the International Christian Embassy. It is neither Christian nor an embassy. They do not preach Jesus. The Jews are being regathered to fulfill the Great Tribulation. They're going to be deceived by the Antichrist and go into a slaughter. And if Jesus didn't come back, none of them would be saved. Yet, we're told that from this time that's of great distress, there'll be a rescue in verse 1. There will be a rescue. And a rescue is coming. We know that to be the rapture and the resurrection. The rapture and resurrection happen simultaneously. Now we have on the four horsemen of the apocalypse tapes, we talk about when the rapture and resurrection will be between the sixth and seventh um, seal in the book of Revelation. But then it continues. And many of those who sleep in the dust on the ground will awake. These to everlasting life, but the others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. And those who have insight will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of heaven. And those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But as for you, Daniel, conceal these words and seal up the book until the end of time. Many will go back and forth and knowledge will increase. Seal it up. There is no new doctrine. There is no new revelation. As soon as you hear some conniver on TV looking for your money who says, the Lord showed me, and it's something not in the scripture, you know you're dealing with one of the deceivers Jesus warned about. That's Copeland, Hagen, Hinn, all of them. No new revelation, but a clearer understanding of what's already in the Bible. Seal these things up to the appointed time. That's what apocalypse means, unveiling something that's hidden. That's what apocalypse, apocalypsis means. It's a literary genre where hidden mysteries are unveiled. It gets clearer and clearer and clearer for the faithful. The stars that shine will be two kinds of people, or people who have two aspects to their character. The stars that shine will not be the ones who resurrect to everlasting contempt. We have a number of people today, like John Stott in England, saying we can't be sure there's a hell. Many of the people in England now, like Roger Forster, who runs the March for Jesus, even in Australia, they say that there's no eternal hell. Well, people who think there's no eternal hell are quite mistaken, and some of them are going to be quite shocked when they get there and find out there is. 
what these people like Roger Foster and so on and Graham Kendrick's people, the ICFIS people basically say is if you don't accept Jesus when you die you'll, you'll be judged and annihilated in other words if you don't repent and accept the Lord you won't exist anymore that's what unsaved people believe anyway that's the powerless gospel of, of the restoration movement and there's more and more people getting into this nonsense if hell is not eternal you can't prove it from the Bible the Greek term enyon ton enyon is forever and ever is the term used for the high priesthood of Jesus the glory of God and our salvation it's also the same Greek term used for the smoke of their torment going up forever and ever if hell is not eternal and conscious how can you be sure heaven is but of course these people don't care much about Greek some of them can't even read English nonetheless let's press on the stars that shine will not be those the stars that shine will be look what it says those who lead many to righteousness and those who have insight those who have insight and those who lead many to righteousness those will be the characteristics of the people who are going to shine forever in eternity those who have insight in the last days faithfulness becomes the barometer of faithfulness has this barometer and understanding in the last days understanding God through his word understanding the word of God becomes the measure the gauge of faithfulness okay look what it says in this chapter verse 10 none of the wicked will understand but those who have insight will understand when the deception increases in the last days none of the wicked will understand why can people not see through things like Benny Hinn or Brian Houston? Because they're wicked. The wickedness of their heart. The wicked won't understand. You see, if you can't see through an obvious false prophet, even a, uh, somebody behaves like a clown like Benny Hinn, what will happen when real deception comes? What will happen when the Antichrist and false prophet put on a show? What will happen if you can't see through a, through a John Avanzini or a Brian Houston or some nonsense like that? what will happen when real deception comes frightening thought in second thessalonians 2 the lord will send a deception that they may believe what is false but let's look none of the wicked will understand the old time pentecostals when they still believe the bible and you have to understand that the good pentecostals are leaving david wilkerson left the assemblies of god jim Cimbola left the assemblies of god philip Howe left the assemblies of god the good people are bowing out left and right because the assemblies of God no longer exists. Okay. You want to see what it is? I'll show you what it is. Here's one coming up in your community by Philip Hills and his wife, Philip and Barbara Hills. I have a letter from Philip Hills. Well, he didn't like me in the letter because I opposed Toronto, but he and his wife are a pair of cartwheeling Toronto fruitcakes, and I'm trying to be gracious. And it says, and it gives you all the prices, and you'll pay a pretty penny for this. Prepare to come away from this conference refired. Here are the electives. How to write your family's story. Understanding aging and health. Introduction to computers. those legal matters and for those should you choose to pray Brian will lead you in an effective hour of prayer you'll come away refired please send the money and then there's some optional blessings a garden tour a ride in a horse and carriage or a spin on a Harley David motorcycle <laughs> for an extra five bucks you'll come away refired who in their right mind would believe such nonsensical idiocy 
What kind of moron would pay five cents, let alone five dollars? Let alone the prices they're asking. If I wanted a spin on a Harley, I'd ask one of my friends who has one to take me for a spin on a Harley. If I wanted to know about aging and health, there's tons of stuff on the internet. Your community center will have that stuff all the time. <laughs> Not jobs. Yeah. By assemblies of God. Andrew Evans' son is the pastor. Philip Hills and his cartwheeling crew of Toronto lunatics will be running it. That's, that, that's their spirituality. They understand the old time Pentecostals weren't like this. That's the reason guys like David Wilkerson and Philip Powell and Jim Cimbola won't touch them. That's the reason why the Assemblies of God in Italy won't even affiliate with these people. They used to sing something. Give me oil in my lamp, keep it burning. Give me oil in my lamp. Thy words a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. They wanted to be the wise virgins who had the illumination of the Holy Spirit to understand the Bible. Thy words a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. The old time Pentes weren't like that. They love the Word of God because they love the Lord Jesus. They're totally different than what you have now. None of the wicked will understand. We are Laodicea, lukewarm, middle class Christianity. Thinking because they're wealthy, they're blessed. Again, I pointed out that I met a Christian TV producer in Sydney, young woman. Knew Brian Houston, she said the only reason she felt he had any time for her was because she was in the media. And she went to him, across him about some of these issues, and he said, well, ministries like Philip Powell, they have to trust God for money. Look at all the money we have. God's blessing us, not him. Too ignorant and too carnal to know that he's fulfilling the exact thing Jesus warned about. Because you say you're rich, you don't know you're wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. See, God has a different measure as I pointed out yesterday, to, to gauge faithfulness. This is what he says. God says this. Take my instruction, not silver, and knowledge rather than choice is gold. Wisdom's better than jewels. God says, understand this book. Understanding will get you out of here. Money will not. You can't serve God and mammon. They serve mammon. Why is he using the world's measure, the world's standard, to gauge faithfulness? Because he's of the world. Worldly churches will measure things the way the world does money. They measure with the world's standard because they're of the world and not of Jesus Christ. None of the wicked will understand. Now you have to understand what this means in the context. It goes back to the previous chapter 11. Look at verse 33 to 35. Some of those who have insight among the people will give understanding to the many, yet they will fall by the sword, by flame, by captivity, and by plunder for many days. And in verse 35, some of those who have insight will fall in order to refine, purge, etc. Up to verse 36, you have a partial historic fulfillment in the story of the Maccabees. The books of 1st and 2nd Maccabees in the Apocrypha, the intertestamental literature, you can read about it. Daniel is predicting what would happen with the Seleucids. Alexander the Great's empire fragmented between four of his generals. And one of them was Seleucus. The other was, one of the other ones was Ptolemy, but Seleucus formed the Seleucid Empire. They were Syrophoenician Greeks. Out of it came a dynasty of Antiochus. Antiochus I, the second, the third, but Antiochus IV is known as Antiochus Epiphanes. He set up an image of the Greek god Zeus in the temple, giving Zeus his own features, and slaughtered a pig in the temple. This Antiochus Epiphanes is a major, major shadow of the Antichrist, setting up the image in the temple. Now a group of Hebrew priests, the Maccabees, you had a priest and his five sons, led a guerrilla war against the Seleucids. And they liberated the temple, and then they rededicated it. This is the Jewish feast of Hanukkah, which Jesus celebrates in John chapter 10, where it says the Feast of Dedication in John 10, that's what Jesus was celebrating, Hanukkah. 
the rededication of the temple after it was defiled by this proto-antichrist in the Old Testament. Up to verse 36, Antiochus fulfills this. From verse 36 onwards, somebody coming in the last days in the character of Antiochus is going to do what Antiochus did and more. That is the Antichrist. Looking to deceive the elect. How did Antiochus get power? He seduced Jews into collaborating with him. And he began Hellenizing Israel. Hellenizing meant Greekizing, bringing in the popular culture of Greece. Bring it into God's house. What is Philip Hills doing? He's just bringing the popular culture of the world into God's house. Spirit of Antichrist. Small groups began joining themselves to the Maccabees and they were betrayed by many people. In the last days that'll happen. There'll be people who will come to discernment circles and to churches that stand against this stuff, but they'll have a wrong motive. They'll have their own agenda. <clears throat> because somebody's against what you're against doesn't mean they're for what you're for. The people who will come am among us saying that they're against what we're against, but they have their own agenda. These are people who don't fall out with churches over principles or doctrines or moral issues. They'll fall out with any church they go to. You understand? They bounce from church to church and fall out anywhere and they try to attach themselves to churches that stand for truth because they're just rebels and they're looking for a platform to be rebels and that's what happened with the Maccabees and that'll happen in the last days and it is happening however the first one that the Maccabees knocked off, assassinated it was not a Seleucid it was in a village called Moedin and they assassinated a Jew called Menelaus who collaborated with the Seleucids. The real threat, the real enemy, is never the unbeliever. It's the believer, so-called, who cooperates with him. Ecumenical evangelicals are the traitors. Now, we don't shoot them with arrows or kill them with swords anymore. This is our sword. We shoot them with the Word of God. Men like Chuck Colson need to be shot. People who are ecumenical, who try to bring us into interfaith religion, who endorse union with Islam, who endorse union with Rome, who endorse union with Hinduism, who try to bring the world into God's house, they're the en enemy inside. We don't kill them with bullets. This is our weapon. Turn the word of God on them. The Maccabees understood this and gave understanding to others. In the last days, people in the character of the Maccabees will do this. Now, if you want to learn about this in depth, we have tapes and videos explaining it. You can get in the back. I'm only dealing with it relevant to our subject today. They had understanding. The others were misled. The first kind of star that will shine in the resurrection are those who understand the word of God. The wise virgins. Not everybody's being raptured. Jeremiah 8.20, harvest has ended, summer has passed, we are not saved. The Song of Solomon, in chapter 3, the bride was ready. Chapter 5, she was left. The foolish virgins are going no place. Now notice this. At a time, we should be getting deeper into the Word of God. The apocalypse, when things are being made known. At a time, we see prophecies being fulfilled under our nose in the Middle East. We're getting further and further away from the Word of God into experience further and further away from the study of Scripture into Philip Hills and Assemblies of God type rubbish. This is the devil trying to get you into this garbage so you won't get into the Word of God. That's all it is, it's a trap by men who the devil uses, like Philip Hills. He works for the devil. Anybody who promoted Toronto worked for the devil. Just think of that. Apocalypse is being unveiled. We should be getting deeper into the scriptures. We need to understand Daniel, Revelation, Ezekiel. We need to understand what these things mean. And at a time we should be getting deeper into the Bible, they're getting further away. You've got people like Tommy Tenney writing books demeaning the Bible as dusty old truth. People like Gerald Coates in England saying, that's where God said that it's insufficient, the insufficiency of scripture. 
Bible's being ignored in favor of rubbish. Do you understand that there's charismatics who've never had a Bible study? They've supposedly been Christians 25 years and they've never had a Bible study? They've never heard exegesis? It's always a couple of verses out of context mixed with psychology? And they think that that's doctrine? Or somebody having a picture or a word that's, that's not even real? It's clairvoyance, it's not even prophecy, it's clairvoyance, and that's the word of God to them, they don't even know any better? At a time they should be getting deeper in, they're getting further away. When I was first saved, the shelves of big Christian bookshops were stocked with books about the return of Jesus in the, in the 1970s, the early 70s. That was all the talk. People were saying, Maranatha, the Lord is coming. People were watching Middle East events. They were reading books about the return of Christ. Now they're reading Seven Steps to Victory, Five Keys to Prosperity. The very fact that there's less interest in the return of Jesus now than there was 25, 30 years ago, despite the fact that we're 25, 30 years closer to his coming, is a deception in itself. You want to be ready for Jesus to come, the best thing you can do is get out of the assemblies of God and churches like that. Get out of ecumenical churches. That's the first step. Get out of it. They're going to Babylon. You want to be a star that shines? Get away from the deception. Those who have insight will shine. And those who turn many to righteousness. We are never once called to lead people to Christ. Never. I believe in evangelism. I strongly believe in evangelism. I believe evangelism is the lifeblood of the church. Evangelism minus discipleship equals zero. Jesus never said to make converts. He said make converts disciples. This nonsense you see, even men I once respected like Billy Graham putting converts back into Roman churches, saying he has fellowship with Mormons. Look what's happening today. Evangelism that's cheap grace. Grace is free, but it is not cheap. Unless you understand law, you will not understand grace. You want to listen to somebody good, listen to Ray Comfort, the, the Jew from, from New Zealand. We should be using eschatology, prophecy, to preach the gospel. But no, that's negative. We have to be seeker-friendly today. We have to give people Philip Hill's type rubbish, or, 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 or Bill Hybels type rubbish. Then they want to know why it doesn't work. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Bill Bright has gone down the road to Rome, even into faith worship. That's Campus Crusades. Or... There's a God-shaped void in your heart and Jesus wants to fill it. Or, I love this nonsense. Every eye closed. Every head bowed. Just accept Jesus into your heart. Slip your hand up. Yes, I see. God bless you, brother. Yes, sister. We'd like to invite you to accept Jesus tonight. What garbage! God never invites anybody. The scripture says he commands men repent. He said, go out and compel them to come to the feast. He never invites anybody. Where? What did the apostles say? Save yourself from this perverse generation. Where did Wesley preach like that? He never did. Where did Whitfield preach like that? Never did. Where did D.L. Moody preach like that? Never did. Where did anybody God ever used to bring revival preach like that? They never did because it's not biblical. It's garbage. It's stupidity. It's nonsense. They want to know why after 10 years of Alpha courses in England, church attendance in England has decreased by 22%. Why a thousand people a week leave the Church of England in England, despite how since Alpha began? Why does Alpha not work? It never dawns on them. Dawns on them. The reason it doesn't work is it's not biblical. Look at the Great Commission. Look what Jesus said in Matthew 28, the closing verses. Verse 19, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I command you. 
Did he say make converts or make disciples? Make disciples. There's a big difference. We don't lead people to Christ. We lead them to Christ's likeness. Those who turn many to righteousness. And the first step of discipleship is what? Believer's baptism. Find believer's baptism in an alpha course. You won't. It's Anglican. It's based on Triludianism. It's for the unchurched, not the unsaved. What do you expect from a denomination that ordains homosexuals? Go therefore and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Tommy Tenney and these people, he's oneness. T.D. Jakes is oneness background. They don't even believe in the Trinity. They're oneness. They believe in ancient her heresies like Sabellianism. The Father is Jesus, Jesus is Jesus, the Holy Spirit is Jesus. I asked one of them once, well, how come then, if, if it's only one and not three persons, one God and three persons, that that's not the case, how come when Stephen was being martyred, he saw Jesus at the right hand of the Father? He saw two. You know what his answer was? If somebody was hitting you in the head with rocks, you'd be seeing double as well. <laughs> Again, you, you're dealing with people who are behaving like morons. And they're following people like this. They're following Tenny. Teaching them to observe all I command you, all. Not some, not the bits you agree with. Well, you don't agree with believer's baptism. Why don't we teach the bits we agree with? You have an Alpha Course book, put a match to it. It contains no clear presentation of the gospel, no clear one, and no biblical model of discipleship whatsoever. It's based on the Holy Spirit weekend away to get people into Toronto. You want to know what Alpha is for? Nicky Gumbel said, it's the Holy Spirit weekend away to get people into the laughing drunken thing. That's its purpose. That's what the people who write it say. Then they want to know why there's a 22% decline in church attendance in England since Alpha began. You don't need a brain. The Bible never says make converts, make disciples, those who turn many to righteousness. There's a big difference. There's a term that secular psychologists all know. There's a term that sociologists all know, that psychiatrists all know. The term is called functional autonomy. Functional autonomy. If you don't know what functional autonomy is, I'll tell you what it is. It's when a means to an end becomes an end in itself. For instance, in the 1950s, people in the outbacks of Australia had a hard life found it difficult to get by financially. So a kid grows up with parents who are always broke, living in the outbacks. And in those days, they were still dropping school lessons by airplane. to the sheep stations and that. And this kid says, I'm never going to know this kind of hardship again. I'm going to get an education. I'm going to get a business and become successful. So this kid begins to study and study. Manages to go to university. Graduates university, goes to postgraduate school, then goes to work for a corporation and learns an industry from the inside. Then he opens his own business and he struggles financially, trying to meet the payroll and his taxes first five years, first ten years, then the money begins coming in. Then it really comes in, then he makes his first million. A few years later, his first million becomes his second. And then overnight he's got five and then ten. Pretty soon the guy's got 25 million, he can easily retire to surface paradise, never work a day in his life, but something's happened. If I can make 25, I can make 50. The means to an end has become an end in itself. Functional autonomy has taken over. His aim is no longer the original aim, his aim is the means. The means to an end has become the goal. What happens with human sexuality? Well, love. Two people joined in holy wedlock, being joined together. The aim of sex is love. And then to share the love with the baby. So you begin thinking, well, how do we get the baby? Well, it's the means to an end. What happens when love no longer becomes the aim? Just having sexual experiences. Now, love has been usurped by lust. Somebody who just wants to chase the sexual experience without reference to love is going to go into immorality. They're going to go into fornication or adultery. 
Once more, functional autonomy is taken over. A good thing has become a bad thing. A quest to escape poverty has become greed. Love has become lust. As erotically pleasurable as the good Lord designed sex to be, and it's his idea, he invented it, we corrupted it under the influence of Satan. Its aim was love. Means to an end becomes an end in itself. Functional autonomy, the world runs on it. Well, what happens when functional autonomy gets into the church? The pursuit of revival. What is the aim, the goal of revival? Righteousness. I want to see babies stop being aborted. I want to see Eastern religion and Islam thrown back in your country. I want to see homosexuals get saved. I want to see them stop teaching this stuff to kids in schools. I want to see the pornography going off the television. I want to see righteousness. That's what the Lord wants. Turn many to righteousness. What happens when the pursuit of righteousness, the desire for revival, becomes functional autonomy, takes over? And now you're just pursuing revival. <laughs> Once more, you're just tracing experience. Lust is not real love. Well, either is people chasing experience, real revival. You'll wind up with a counterfeit of love, you'll wind up with a counterfeit of revival. Why? Functional autonomy is taken over. They're going nuts. Oh, we're having a revival. <laughs> I've been to Toronto. <laughs> I've been in Pensacola. <laughs> These people are lunatics. They're absolutely mad. David Carlage is a hooplehead. Philip Hills is a danger. These men, I wonder if they ought to be sedated for their own protection. Let alone the good of the church. The world laughs at them, and I don't blame the world. Now, I was saved in a revival. I saw a genuine move of God among the hippies, the Jesus people. We didn't find love and peace, taking acid and free love and the rest of it. All we found was drug addiction, venereal disease, etc. But God moved among the hippies. There was a real revival, a real one. When you've seen a real revival, nobody's going to tell you Toronto or Pensacola is a revival. When you've seen the real thing, nobody's going to listen to a man like, 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 like Andrew Evans. Nobody will pay attention to people like that. They know better. It's only when you've not seen the real you believe a counterfeit. Nobody, one, nobody would give one second of attention to a man like David Cartledge or Philip Hills if they knew the Word of God. If you saw a real revival, you wouldn't want a counterfeit. Righteousness. Instead of pursuing righteousness, they're pursuing having a revival. That's like, instead of pursuing love, you're pursuing lust. You wind up with a counterfeit that destroys any possibility of the real thing. Lust destroys any possibility of real, real intimacy. Well, so Toronto, Pensacola, the Assemblies of God, they destroy any real possibility of revival. Can't even happen. Jesus never said make converts. He said make disciples. God couldn't pour out his spirit because if people got saved, where are you going to bring them to be disciples? The Taranga Zoo? Hillsong? You've got enough kangaroos in Australia. What do you need more kangaroos for? You see, it's just like the world. There's stars and there's stars. Whenever I'm down here in the Southern Hemisphere, be it South Africa, Australia, or New Zealand, or wherever, I have a habit every night, when the, if the, star, if the sky is clear, the weather's good, of looking up at the Southern Cross. There is no particular reason I look at the Southern Cross except for the fact that you can't see it from England or America. You don't get a very good view except for one or two hours on certain times of the year seasonally, I'm told, of Orion's Belt or the Northern Star. So I guess if I was an Aussie and I was in Britain or California, I'd be looking at the North Star or Orion's Belt. But down here, I look at the Southern Cross simply because I can't see it. New Zealand, Zimbabwe, South Africa, Australia, I'm always looking. Every night I look for it. Stars that shine. But you know, if you're a stargazer and you're looking up at the stars and a shooting star comes by, it gets your attention really quick. It illuminates the whole sky. It's the one star that stands out. <clears throat> Look at that. Did you see it? No, I missed it. 
You got to be quick. Shooting stars come. Now, a lot of the times, astronomers tell us there aren't even stars. They're meteorites or something. You know what the meteorites are? These astral projectiles with no fixed orbit around the sun. Think about it. Did you see that one? Well, it may come. It may be impressive for a second or two. But the Southern Cross is still up there. Orion's belt is still up there. Northern Star is still up there. Shooting stars come and go. Shooting stars. The world is great at shooting stars. Where is Marilyn Monroe now? Where is Rudolph Valentino now? Where are the pop icons of my generation? Where's Jimi Hendrix, John Lennon now? Probably most of them places we wouldn't want to be. Shooting stars. Hollywood can make shooting stars. The pop music industry makes shooting stars. Here today, gone tomorrow, if they last that long. But God wants stars that are going to shine forever. Here's a different. Yet the church is like Hollywood, only they're not as good at it. They can put on programs and music things like Hillsong, but you know what? They're never going to do it as good as the world. The church will never do it as good as the world. You can't compete with Hollywood. Drive down the Gold Coast and go to Warner Brothers and see how they make the movies. The world will never compete with, the church will never compete with the world. Never. You're never going to do it as good as the world. The seeker-friendly, user-friendly rubbish, the bait you use to lure somebody is the food you're going to have to feed them to keep them. But the world will always do it better. You have to have something that the world can't give. And we have it, but they don't want to give them that. They want to give them rides on a Harley Davidson motorcycle. That's what the Assemblies of God has to offer. Stars that shine or a shooting star. Where's Toronto now? It's over. Rodney Howard Brown used to speak to large audiences. Now he's up in Darwin. Most people in Australia don't even know he's here. Pensacola split two months ago. It's split. Kilpatrick and Michael Brown fighting with each other in public. The crowds are gone. It's on the internet. It's in the Christian newspaper. It's over. Kansas City came and went, came to nothing. Toronto came and went, came to nothing. Toronto, Pensacola comes and goes, nothing. Gold teeth here today, gone tomorrow. Doesn't matter what it is. Shooting star, shooting star, shooting star. But the cross is still up there. You want to be a shooting star? You can go to Hollywood. In fact, you don't even have to travel that far. You can just go down the Gold Coast to Warner Brothers. You want to be a shooting star? Go to the world. The world is good at making shooting stars. It gets everybody's attention. But it don't last. Those are not the kind of stars God wants. Those who turn many to righteousness will shine forever. Those who have insight and give understanding to the many will shine forever. That's what God says. None of the wicked will understand, but those who have insight will understand, verse 10. Those who have insight, many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake, these to everlasting life, but others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. And those who have insight will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of heaven. And those who lead the many to righteousness will shine like the stars forever and ever. My dear brethren in Jesus, God is out to make you a star. God bless.